Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly mentoring hour, where it's a time for questions, discussions, and interactions. It can be on any topic that's there in our mind. So encourage each one of us to ask questions and share thoughts so that we all can learn together. So before we could start, um, can I request one of us to lead us in prayer, please? Agni, can I request you to lead us in prayer? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful morning, Lord. Thank you that you are with us, Father, day after day, according to your promise, which says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Father. We thank you that your mercies are raining upon us, Father, and thank you for this beautiful fellowship, time of learning, time of growing in your truth, Father. And Lord, Father, we know that you are present with us. We thank you that you lead us by your Holy Spirit. We give you all control, Father. Let your name be glorified through this fellowship, Father. Anoint the pastors and anoint all the students to Lord, Father. Ask good questions, Father. And let your wisdom be released and we may receive good answers, Father, and that whatever we may learn may help us to grow the kingdom of God on this earth. Let your will be done and let your kingdom come on this earth, Father. We need you more than ever before, Father. We look up to heavens for all our needs, Father, and thank you that you are a, you are a Jehovah Jireh who provides everything that we need on this earth to live a victorious life. Once again, we thank you for all the pastors. We thank you for all the students. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love, grace, and mercy, which is continually our part and our portion. We thank you for leading us, guiding us, and strengthening us this morning. Once again, we commit everything into your hands. Lord, take control. In the matchless name of Jesus, our Savior, we ask and pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes, so we encourage each one to please ask questions and share your thoughts uh, either on the chat or you can unmute and ask questions. Okay, uh, can I ask? Yes, please. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Once again, uh, my question is, uh, the, the word says fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. And uh, we know that um, the fear comes by knowing the Lord. So can an unbeliever or uh, somebody who does not know the Lord still walk in the wisdom of the Lord? Can he have the wisdom without knowing the Lord? That's my question. Uh, why I'm asking is because we see many of the unbelievers also walking in a way which seems to be right. But um, mm, so that's my question. Thank you, Abni. Uh, yes, vote our faculty, anyone who could take up this question and answer. Um. Yeah, I just uh, make a couple of comments. Uh, one is um, uh, one scripture to refer to is uh, in Romans chapter two, um, where it it tells us that you know God has placed in every man. This is Romans two and verse fifteen um, that the law is written in their hearts. That means um, you know. Uh, so we call this the conscience. So the law of God is written in the heart of every person. So even for, you know, regardless whether the person is a believer or not, uh, when, you know, when they're born, the way uh, the God has placed his law uh, in their hearts. So um, uh, we call this the conscience, right? So there is, uh, at, uh, at the time of birth, uh, there is a uh, call it, let's say, a predisposition, or we can even call it a knowing uh, in every human person what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is not good. 
there, there is that. So we call it the conscience. So uh, as people grow up and they start living out of that conscience, they're actually living out of the law of God in their hearts. So that's one thing. Now, this conscience can, of course, be destroyed, uh, which is what most which is, which is what happens in most cases. That is, as we grow up because of all the influences of the world, and the Bible says our conscience can become dead, it can become seared, it can become dulled. So that's usually what happens. But you we do find in, you know, in general cases, some cases where people are living out of that law that's written in their hearts, doing what's right, what's wrong. So while they may not necessarily express reverence for God in the sense of you know, worshiping the true and living God or knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But the fact that God has already placed his law in the in their hearts, them walking according to it, they, you know, they tend to do the right things. They they have this sense of right rightness and wrongness. Right. So that's one thing. The second thing we see in Isaiah 32 uh, is that um, yeah, when it comes to natural wisdom, or I would say the, the wisdom to understand creation, the wisdom to understand. And I'm just looking at um, Isaiah. So what did I say? Isaiah 32. Um, I think it's Isaiah 28 then, sorry. Yeah. So Isaiah 28, and I'm looking at, um, you know, tw Isaiah 28 verses 23 to 29. Isaiah 28 verses 23 to 29. So, when it comes to understanding creation and uh, you know the 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 ways to exploit, uh, I use the word exploit in a good sense. That means uh, to put things that we discover in nature in creation uh, for the benefit of humankind. That understanding again, God gives to all people, regardless. Now, as believers, we sh we definitely should be positioned to receive that and more of that because of our place in Christ. But the fact is, uh, God, like Jesus said, you know, God causes the sun to shine on the good and the evil. He causes the rain to fall on the good and evil. So in that, in, in that sense, the ability to harness what God has placed in creation, which is described here in Isaiah 28, 23 to 29, okay. is, is given to every person, I mean, given to people regardless of uh, their faith in Christ or not. So even there we see uh, that uh, people who may not necessarily believe in the living God or believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are able to make these wonderful discoveries uh, in nature, in creation, come up with ways of leveraging them for the benefit of humankind. So that's also uh, 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 something to keep in mind. So from that sense, we can see people who don't know God demonstrate a great sense of rightness in, 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 in their way of living, also express great sense of, you know, uh, intelligence, uh, just because God gives that to all people. You know, he makes it available to people. Yeah. That's sort of what I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> I also have a follow-up question, Pastor. So my question is, uh, then uh, how do we differentiate between a man with good conscience and like uh, in terms of uh, earthly living that uh, we, we, we've heard that there are believers who live with an unrenewed mind and then there are people with good conscience. So people with unrenewed mind, uh, believers with unrenewed mind and uh, you know, are they as vulnerable as um, uh, people with good conscience and not having Jesus? Uh, I hope my question is clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the big difference is the uh, it's one thing to know what's right and wrong. Uh, it's the other thing to be able to do that uh, in consistently. So... Uh, and and there is there is the power of the human will, right? Um, so God has given all of us a will, right? So um, the human will can also be trained and disciplined and trained. So uh, and, and and to say it honest, 
plainly an unsaved person living out of that good conscience who has a strong will can demonstrate demonstrate a higher level of piety you know a good life than a believer who has embraced Christ but is living according to a carnal mind so that is true that's possible you know in terms of way of life but we understand that you know we're not saved by works so even that person who's who's living by a good conscience with a strong will and demonstrating a good life is not going to be saved because of that of course they will sin and so on so but is that possible the answer is yes it is possible thank you Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Agni. I hope that answered your question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have Kiran's, uh, Kiran asking an uh, explanation on 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse, verse 1 to 3. Uh, can I request Pastor Nancy uh, to please share uh, an explanation on this scripture, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Anna. I'll uh, just share what I know. Um, okay, so uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. Uh, I'll read it out first. Um, it says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed to you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Okay, uh, okay. so uh, just a moment, I'll just back up a little bit. Okay, uh, yes. So uh, here what Paul is saying is um, he is expressing uh, his, um, um, uh, you know, uh, like uh, out of his apostolic authority, uh, what he's saying is that he has, uh, he has imparted the truth in the uh, Corinthian church and, uh, you know, uh, and, and we know that, you know, it's the word of God which, which works in the life of the believer, which cleanses and prepares the believer. So uh, as he has uh, served and he has raised up uh, this body of believers, you know, he, um, uh, he is wanting them to continue in the same way and continue uh, to be that chaste bride prepared for the return of Christ. And, uh, you know, he does not want any form of wrong teaching or sin to corrupt uh, this good work that has been done in them. Um, and, you know, he's, uh, he's talking like the, uh, the, the, a sort of the friend of the bridegroom. So we know that the Lord Jesus, he is the bridegroom who is going to return for the chaste, for the glorious bride. And uh, he wants to preserve the body of believers whom he had worked with thus far. Um, uh, you know, he, he wants them to continue in, in, the, in such a way that they are a prepared bride for Christ. So uh, that is the simple meaning of this passage. But you know, I would like to request me, Pastor, you could probably add to it, Pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank so. Um, yeah. Thanks, uh, Nancy. Yeah. So the the other. So just adding to what uh, Nancy has already shared. Uh, so that what's happening in the Corinthian church is that there are people who are coming in, and uh, one of the things that's happening is they're questioning, you know, Paul's apostolic authority that, as an apostle and therefore things that he has been teaching. And so that's what Paul is expressing, right? He says, I don't want you to be deceived, you know, um, just like 
uh, how he was deceived. He's expressing his uh, concern for the people. He says, I, I, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, you know? So it's like he, he's showing his heart. I want to, I want to protect these people, you as, as a church body. I'm God, jealous for you with a godly jealousy. And I don't want you to be deceived from the simplicity that is in Christ, right? So because these people are coming in, they're causing confusion, a lot of things, uh, uh, trying to take people away from the simple faith in Christ. And so that's what he's expressing. Um, yeah, good. Thank, Thank you. you, Pastor. Uh, Kiran, I hope that answered your question. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, please feel free to go ahead, post your questions on the chat, or um, you can also unmute and ask. We have one question from Sid saying, uh, nowadays, in, uh, okay, in Punjab and northern region of India, pastors have four bouncers or bodyguards, something like that, right, in order to protect them in an interview. One such pastor was asked, what is the reason of keeping bouncers? He told that I am a popular personality with name and respect, and I want this for my security. Okay. So your question is, is it right to have uh, those bouncers when the scripture says that uh, God has commanded his angels to watch over us and guard us? Um, yeah, uh, I can, um, can I request Pastor Roshan to share your thought on this, please? Hey, thanks, Diana. <laughs> I kind of knew you would ask me. <clears throat> uh, I really don't know what to comment on that. Uh, I, I, I genuinely don't know what to say on that. Uh, yeah, but is there someone else who can just probably comment on that? Pastor please? Paul, yeah. you would like to share your thought? Anyone in the team? Okay, uh, I'll, just, I'll just share like uh, practically. Uh, I feel, uh, said, uh, see, there, there will be times like if in ministry you start off small, nobody really knows you. And then uh, as the ministry grows big and the church goes, grows big, and uh, you know, as a pastor or evangelist, you may be traveling to different places. And uh, uh, now, the what I would say is, if if that pastor feels comfortable in having one or two people to protect him, and just so that you know, it, uh, it's not like saying I don't have faith, but I believe that if he wants some kind of protection, maybe from, especially we know that in North India there are persecutions and uh, people attacking Christians and Christian leaders, if he feels that, uh, you know, having some kind of protection around him, if it's helpful for him, uh, then let him go ahead and do it. Um, and if, you know, it's not, it's not that just because he has two or three security guards or bouncers or whatever, it's not that he doesn't have faith. Now, Psalms 91 is yes, he talks about uh, you know, God's protection. Uh, but there are also practical things. Uh, like, for example, if we are driving or, or we're riding the bike, we have to wear a helmet. Uh, we can't say Psalms 91 and ride without a helmet. Uh, so we got to follow those practical rules. So if if he, this pastor, feels that, okay, uh, I need some, you know, two people to, you know, uh, you know be like uh, security or bouncers next to me, if the pastor feels safe uh, and if he feels that, okay, uh, you know, it's good for the ministry, I mean, you know, it helps him uh, to keep protected from persecutions or people who are trying to attack him, then he can go ahead and do it. And I feel that as, as believers, as pastors or in the ministry, um, this is not a big deal. Uh, so more than all of this, we can, you know, focus our attention on other things. But yes, I, I believe that if if the pastor is does have people around him to protect him, and if it's safe for him, uh, he can go ahead and do it. And I feel there's nothing wrong with that. Thank you, thank you, Sid. Thank you. So you mean to say, if the pastor's life isn't threatened, then you can have some security guard to guard him? Is it so? Something like that. 
uh, just so that because he uh, Sid mentioned that it's in Punjab and maybe pastors mm -hmm. in North India go through that on a daily basis. So okay. it's something wrong to have some kind of protection. Okay. Uh, Pastor, I, yeah, uh, I, just want, I just want to add to add to what uh, Paul has said. Yes, uh, one is just the practical things, right? Like we, first, uh, I can think of two simple examples. One is, uh, you know, like all of us believe Psalm 91, uh, but uh, we all lock our the door of our homes when you go to sleep. <laughs> you know, it's just a practical thing. You know, mm -hmm. if we believe Psalm 91, why do you want to lock your house? You know, well, because um, uh, we do believe God has given his angels charge over us. But um, within the realm of our responsibility, we take whatever safety measures we can. Right? So we close the door of our house, we lock the house or whatever lock your car, lock your vehicle when you go. So that's us doing our responsibility. Right? So that's exactly what Paul was sharing. The other practical thing is simple, a simple thing, you know, and which we also sometimes practice, which is uh, suppose, you know, imagine this pastor, he gets down, uh, he comes to the venue where he's supposed to preach or minister. He gets down from his car and from the time he goes or from his vehicle and from the time he goes from there to the entrance of the auditorium the stage, you know, you know, because he's a pastor, a lot of people want to talk to him. Now, four or five people come to him at that time. Uh, what will happen? You know, he has to shoo them away. He said, no, I have to go to there. You know, it's going to be very disruptive. Whereas if you have, uh, so those people can't see the angels of God. You know, they just see the pastor. So they're going to come and stop him, say, Pastor, pray for me, or I have a question, or how about this, that, and all. Now, he cannot attend to that because his service is going on. He has to go in there and minister. And so in order to, you know, to prevent that disruptive internet, just a practical thing, if he has, you know, three or four people around him, they can just escort him straight into the venue so that uh, it is psychologically people stay away from interrupting him so that he can get onto the stage and, you know, minister and there. There may be hundreds, mm -hmm. thousands, hundreds of thousands of people waiting to be ministered to. Right. So that's also a very practical thing. It's it's not even for safety. It's just for ease of movement from point A to point B. Uh, there may be people say, Pastor, pray for me. Pastor, bless me. Pastor, do this for me. And if he has to stop and do that, whole service will be delayed. You know, And there are thousands of people waiting inside the hall or on the grounds for him. So just as an escort to take him there without any disruption, this is a practical thing, and we also do it. So as uh, just to add to what Paula said, it's just a practical thing that is uh, both from security and to avoid disruption. So there's a, you know, you keep things on time, you move things smoothly. So uh, there's nothing wrong. Uh, only thing is we shouldn't take pride in it. You know, look, I have so many guards, and then that can lead to disaster. Yeah. Yeah, but. thank you. Thank you, Pastor. That was a very important point. And all the facilities, we should not take pride in it. That's right. Thank you. Sid, I hope that answered your question. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. So, yeah, next question. You can just unmute and ask or share your interest where we can discuss on. Yes, Divya, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Diana. My question is uh, about, uh, we read, uh, especially during the last days, there will be a lot of apostasy or falling away mm -hmm. of the believers from the faith. So uh, uh, such times, uh, yeah, we do see it also nowadays, like many are falling away from the faith. Uh, so uh, how as... Uh, you know, a believer, we should, you know, be prepared as well as I'm asking this on behalf of, you know, our uh, loved ones who may be, um, you know, just uh, very, uh, like, not much mature in the faith. So, uh, so how can a believer be prepared? Because we see a lot of that in our current situations. That's my question. Hope I'm clear. Uh, your, your question, please. How can I, how can we be prepared? 
yeah how can a believer you know be alert and be watchful during these times because it's i believe it's very subtle okay 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 sister jean would you like to take up this question please um okay yeah thank you uh, diana um uh, i think i just want to make a reference to one scripture and uh, probably then um, you know hand it over to uh, any of the other faculty uh, i'm just turning just give me a minute please Okay, this is in First Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, and I'll just uh, read that. Um, yeah, I'll just read that. Um, uh, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from what we believe. They will follow lying spirits and teachings that come from demons. These teachers are hypocrites and liars. They pretend to be religious, but their consciences are dead. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanksgiving by people who know and believe the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it. We may receive it gladly with thankful hearts, for we know it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. So um, this is just a description of uh, you know the last time, last days, where there are where there is going to be um, a departing of faith. There will be deceiving spirits. There will be doctrines of demons. Um, there will be uh, the conscience that's seared, and of course, a lot of other practical issues are also given. Um, I, I think one one of the points that I would want to bring us bring up is what is said in verse five. It says to be sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So for those of us who are believers, it is to stand, uh, uh, you know, con continuously meditating on God's word, being in God's word, uh, keeping our lives in prayer, uh, as well as extending that prayer to those who may be in, like, like uh, Divya was talking about, maybe it's the family, to ensure that. So uh, that's one part uh, of of that answer and, and leave it open to those to the others thank you Dan. Okay. thank you sister thank Jean you. and pastor nancy you would like to add on or roshan paul anyone would like to add on to this please yeah just a very short thought um um as, yeah bible is uh, constantly you know uh, telling us to be vigilant uh, you know multiple verses on that like guard your heart uh you know another scripture is uh, like first peter chapter 5 uh verse 8 to 10 he says be of sober spirit be on the alert your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion so uh it's interesting uh he starts off by saying be of sober spirit uh in other words uh i or I could take away from that is um, in again in Ephesians chapter five verse eighteen Paul says uh, don't be drunk with wine uh, you know to be sober means to not to be drunk but be filled with the Holy Spirit and I think one of the ways to be vigilant uh, is to walk uh, you know have that intimate fellowship and relationship with the Holy Spirit. To, uh, because it's very easy for us to follow the first command which Paul says in. Ephesians 5.18, it says, don't be drunk with wine. He said, yes, I'm not drunk with wine. I'm a Christian, etc. But are we obeying the second commandment that is being filled with the Spirit? So, and I think being filled with the Spirit, walking with the Holy Spirit uh, helps us to be vigilant and live a life that you know, God expects of us. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Pastor yeah, Nancy, please go ahead. Yes, yes. Thank, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Jean and uh, uh, Pastor Ocean, for, for sharing. Um, I'll just add a few things uh, to what you have shared. Um, Hebrews 6, you know, we, uh, we see how um, uh, before this passage, uh, the writer is exhorting the believer to um, the exhorting the believer and saying how important it is for one to be mature. And then Hebrews 6 talks about you know, people who fall away. So not necessarily in the context of the uh, last days, but uh, just a couple of thoughts from this passage uh, in Hebrews 6 verses 11, you know, um, 
we see uh, he says we want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end so that uh, what you hope for may be fully realized then verse 12 we do not want you to become lazy but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised so uh, he uh, is encouraging the believer to continue with diligence till the end uh, to um, you know live that that life of example the way others who have gone ahead uh, and who have finished the race have lived so uh, uh, i believe like in the end days uh, it's important for us to take charge of our our faith and belief in god and you know it's, it's like a personal responsibility and we have to guard it um, and as jean was sharing give ourselves to the word of god give ourselves to prayer uh, and be firmly rooted in the things of god again we see uh, in uh, first peter chapter 4 uh, the passage from verse 7 uh, through 11 where the believer is uh, encouraged in the end times to uh, be serious and watchful in prayers uh, to uh, love you know the body of believers fervently to be hospitable to one another basically to to um, to be given to god uh, and to be given to the body of believers with commitment and love uh, and you know there are other passages also uh, exhorting believers in the end times like when we read the epistles of john he calls for the believers to walk in love and at the same time have a discerning spirit because you know there is the spirit of the antichrist out there in the world uh, that claims that jesus is not god so uh, we must be firmly uh, rooted also in the gospel you know what what is the truth uh, of god's word what is the truth uh, of um, who god is and uh, let nothing no teaching out there or uh, you know no influence out there in the world uh, take us away from what we have learned uh, about god and about the lord jesus christ you know um, and all of that so uh, yeah th- these are some additional thoughts that i wanted to share uh, thank you dana amen thank you thank you so much for sharing in detail pastor nancy the way i hope that answered your question yes yes thank you so much pastor thank nancy. you also roshan and chi man yeah just uh, add one uh, one yes, sorry sorry to interrupt yeah and and I, you know, and i agree with all of what what's been said uh, but i think one simple guideline uh, the bia is for us as believers to avoid strange doctrines and you know the, the scriptures have been referenced by different people already and uh, so the fact see the the the, the, the fact is there are all kinds of new ideas and new doctrines being taught <clears throat> i mean i say new it's, it's not necessarily new it's actually some many times these are all recycled doctrines uh, but they are you know uh, they're taking us away from like what nancy was saying the simplicity of the gospel the message of jesus christ and so but many times uh the preachers uh, <clears throat> are pressured into doing some uh, saying something new because only then you'll have books that sell only then you'll have conferences that people sign up to you know you've got to say something that people haven't heard before so there's a lot of pressure like that but this causes you know weird uh, doctrines you know winds of doctrine and paul told warns the church that there'll be these winds of doctrine blowing the church through the church and, uh, the, and sometimes these are actually demonically inspired to cause confusion confusion in the church so we have to be discerning Uh, to what we hear and listen especially now because of the uh, uh, internet technology we have access to so much of information but not everything that comes out of a preacher's mouth is god you know so you've got to be careful uh, and be discerning and avoid doctrines that are strange uh, that are not aligned to the simplicity of the gospel and who christ is and what he's called us to do i just want to you know kind of reiterate that thanks thank you thank you pastor very important thank you yes um yeah we have received another question from sid okay um uh okay when a person from a different faith would come to church in order to receive a healing or a blessing and they actively participate in the church service and once he is active in the church is it so said uh, that the pastor would ask him to be baptized 
Yes, ma'am. And from the next day, uh, will he be coming to church or he won't be coming? He won't be coming. He won't be coming. Uh, so you mean to say he was not ready to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so how do we deal with this problem in our church? Yeah, it looks like uh, sometimes it's very common to most of the churches where people come uh, seeking for some need and once the need is met, they would not come again to the church or they would not receive uh, the, the God of healing. Um, yeah, uh, I request any of our faculty would like to share on it. I'd like to take up this question. Yes, Diana, I'd just like to yes, put a point. Yes, uh, uh, Yes, and if we look at even Jesus' ministry, uh, one of the things we see that even though thousands of people followed Jesus, uh, more than half of them, you know, did not believe, did not follow Jesus because he was the Messiah, but they followed Jesus because they wanted a healing, they wanted some kind of deliverance or... Uh, so when we look through, you know, uh, study the whole ministry of Jesus, it, uh, you know, the thousands of people that came, many of them uh, did not believe he, Jesus was the Messiah, but he did, they just believed that, okay, this person is doing wonderful miracles and, you know, I want healing and I want healing for my family or deliverance from the situation that I, I am in. And so that's why they followed Jesus. But here's what Jesus did. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus uh, ministered in compassion and power, knowing that, you know, uh, Jesus knew what was in their heart. And, and so he did not shun them away. He did not say, okay, I know that you don't believe that I'm the Messiah, so, uh, you know, I'm not going to bring healing. He didn't say any of that. He knew their heart. He knew that they were following him for healing. And Jesus did not say, okay, you know, if you want healing, you have to keep coming after me. He didn't say that. He, he just ministered healing out of compassion and he ministered out of in power. So I think what we can do is when we have people from other faiths coming into the church, uh, one of the things as a church we focus on is always we focus on power, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes we forget the part of compassion. Right. So uh, we need to blend both compassion and power. And so when people come in, especially they're from other faiths, we pray for them. We share the gospel with them. Uh, we continue to minister to them because there will, be, there will be some people who will immediately accept and, you know, they may want to get water baptized and they, you know, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus. But for some of them, it takes time. It may take six months. It may take a year. It may take longer time as well. But we are doing our responsibility and we are doing what God has called us to do. That is to share the gospel, share the message. And uh, remember that at the end, it is the Holy Spirit that brings conviction upon the person's heart. And so, um, so what we can do is said, uh, just continue to encourage, even if they don't want to come, if you feel that telling them about water baptism is causing them not to come to church, give it some time. Uh, maybe just give them scriptures, continue to teach them uh, out of compassion, out of love, uh, and don't have that, you know, that feeling of, okay, he, uh, he's only coming for, uh, you know, his healing, or he's only coming for deliverance, and, uh, and just remove that, and we just minister out of compassion, just like Jesus did. So uh, just share that thought. Thank you so much. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Sid, did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's a question by John Paul. Uh, we have based uh, on first. Uh, Diana, yes, this one uh, before that by Gazala. Uh, just above sorry. that. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Pastor. I missed it. Yes. Uh, yeah, Gazala is. Say, I'm concerned with the way our young adults waste time. I believe. It's quite subtle and like the drifting away as mentioned in Hebrews. So how do we as parents and elders deal with this practically? Um, yes, very important question. Sorry about it. I missed. Um, Pastor, would you or uh, Sister Jean, anyone can please uh, take this question for us? Yeah, I think I'll uh, let Jean and take this up. Jean, go ahead. 
Okay, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Diana. Um, Gazelle, I think I'll, I'll just uh, uh, refer to one scripture over here in Proverbs where it talks about, you know, it gives us the example of the ant. And it says, uh, uh, you know, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. Um, uh, I, if, if you're looking for a specific practical answer, and then when you look at that scripture, it talks of how industrious the ant is. And if there is something that we need to teach children and young people of being, uh, you know, wise and ensuring that they um, make use of their time, I think the first and foremost way is by is uh, leading through example, is uh, being those role models who, you know, are like the ant, who are industrious. Uh, who ensure that uh, um, they they work together, they take uh, uh, take stock of things. So, uh, for parents and elders, that's the uh, initial, the the most important way because it's um, things like this are never taught; it is caught. And the more that they see people uh, working uh, around them, you know, it helps them to form uh, a sense of uh, discipline in their lives. Um, I'd, I'd say the second thing is uh, to be able to gently lead them, uh, which may be, uh, I mean, I'm saying this because I have teens in my home and uh, it takes a lot of patience. It takes work to remind them over and over again that there are, maybe there is work to be done, there are things to be done. And uh, uh, gentle reminders, uh, yet being firm and disciplined in the way that you do that. Uh, it may not happen in a day, it may not happen in years or in a season, but um, the more that they watch you, the more that you encourage, uh, I believe that uh, that's something that will come come by. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Jean. Uh, Gazala, I hope that answered your question. Uh, um, uh, thank you, Sister Jean. Um, I, I don't know if I understood wrong, but I, I do have a job. I work um, and I think I'm leading properly at least. Uh, so I don't know where 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 this is uh, going wrong. Sorry, I, I, I didn't really understand what we're getting at. Maybe I can uh, add, add, yeah. add a thought. Yeah, because one, is, uh, one is to kind of uh, uh, get them interested in um, in productive things where they are uh, inclined towards. I'm just giving an example. Suppose one of them is uh, very artistic, has you know has an artistic bend. Now they could waste a lot of their time in <laughs> watching lots of videos or whatever shows on that, but maybe because they have that get them interested into a skill which they can use for the future you know so example i'm just giving an example maybe uh, get them interested into graphics design get them interested into uh, you know start developing learning that as a skill you know or get them into video production learn that as a skill or get them into you know any of this there's just so many areas where this the, an artistic bend could be used by practical skills can be developed right so what happens is uh, the development of uh, they are actually moving in their area of interest but they're actually developing a life skill which can bring them money in the future i mean it'll help them professionally same thing if somebody's interested in you know uh, in, let's say programming so like what we did with joshua was in his eighth grade we got him involved into electronics and computers and programming. So he started programming when he was in eighth grade. We got him a computer. Uh, and so he started programming because he, he was just very interested in computers. So we kind of directed him. And so he really caught on to that. But what he was actually developing was a life skill, which, you know, today, you know, you know, but he didn't even have to finish college. He had more experience as a programmer by the time he was in his first year, second year in college than people would have finished a degree you know, a college degree in computer science. He could do more than them by the time he was just starting college because we just got him interested in that skill, which he developed. He just kept learning. And nowadays, you know, you have a lot of courses online and you can actually learn that. So 
what happened was his time was used very, very productively, even though he was pursuing something he was passionate about. You know, um, so like that, if we see, okay, what are they passionate about and what is a skill that can be developed with that passion, but that's going to you know, be useful professionally, you know? Um, and uh, the fact is there are so many options today that uh, we can just put them in, you know, which can, which will be useful professionally in the future. So I would just add that to what Jean said, yeah. Oh, Gazala, your mic is mute. Your mic is mute. Sorry. Thank you, Pastor. I was doing something practically that I, as a parent, can do. I'm, I'm already maxed out. I'm stretched out. I don't know how much harder to do the gymnastics, you know. There is a time of pulling back, yes, praying, fasting, all of that I'm doing. So what you said really helps. Thank you so much. God bless you. I could do with your prayers in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, great to know your question was answered, Ghazala. Okay, we have uh, a question from John based on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. He said, um, we understand that as believers, God expects us to be sanctified completely, uh, spirit, soul, and body. As per 1 Thessalonians 5.23, what all comes under sanctification of spirit. Could you also please uh, help with few scriptures for this? Okay. Um, yeah, can I request Pastor Nancy to take up? A, yeah, yes, Pastor, you can go ahead with it. Uh, I'll just share a few things and then uh, uh, you know others can add to it. Uh, yeah, so John, um, so um, uh, let's see here. Let me just let me just look at Second Corinthians seven one. All right. Um, so uh, Paul in Second Corinthians seven one is uh, he says, you know, uh, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Yeah, so it's very interesting. He says, let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the spirit. So we understand flesh means, okay, all the you know wrong deeds we do. But he's also saying, uh, let us, uh, uh, filthiness of the spirit, things that are touching us on the spirit level. Uh, and some of the things he mentions in the preceding verses of the Second Corinthians 6, if you read uh, earlier, 16 onwards, he's talking about, uh, you know, light cannot fellowship with darkness. Christ cannot fellowship with Satan. And therefore he says, come out and be separate. Don't touch the unclean thing. And I will receive you. I'll be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters. So God has given us this. But then he continues chapter 7, verse 1. Yeah. Cleanse us of all filth in his flesh and spirit. So there are things that contaminate us or affect us spiritually. And what would these be? These would be the unseen things, you know, like attitudes, pride, jealousy, hatred, uh, bitterness, uh, competition, strife. Uh, you know, those, those things which uh, not always manifest in deeds like, you know, murder or adultery or... <laughs> things like that, but they are things of the spirit, right? But they are also classified as works of the flesh, uh, but they are things in, in sight, in our inner person, which we need to keep away. So when we say the sanctifying the spirit, or keeping the spirit pure, it means these wrong things, you know, which people can't see, you know, no, Many, very many times, you know, people can't see if you have hate towards somebody else. They, on the outside, they'll say, oh, very nice person. But inside, he could be having hate towards, uh, you know, somebody. But hate, God can see. And it's a, it contaminates the spirit. So it cleanses ourselves from all of those things. Is that okay, John? Uh, others can add to it, please. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor Nancy, you would like to share? Uh, add on to what Pastor said, please. 
Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Dana. I think we've run out of time, but actually I have a follow-up question uh, more than, you know, giving a response. Uh, Pastor, uh, maybe uh, we could address that sometime. Uh, I'm just wondering, because the spirit is perfect, um, it's, been, it's made perfect, the born-again spirit. Uh, so yes, there can be influences that can that can affect the spirit, but I'm, I'm just wondering, Pastor, because in the uh, body and in the soul, um, we we talked about the flesh, which can get contaminated, but can the spirit get contaminated? I'm I'm a little, uh, yeah, confused about that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is this, right? Uh, um, so we distinguish between the human spirit and God's Holy Spirit. So our human spirit, as spirit, we are in Christ. But it doesn't mean we so that we are perfected in the sense that that's um, uh, you know so there is this what we and the way we distinguish it is um, what God has completed for us in Christ and where we are re actually right that means we are in our journey of, of with God so this is what God has given to us in Christ positionally so that's positional truth and there is the practical side that means where are we so we're all born again. We're all in Christ positionally. Practically, we have to walk. So, as, so we see things. Our spirit has to grow. So sp the human spirit, for each of us, we're not all at the same level. Right? Each one of us have to grow. The human spirit has to grow. The human spirit has to be strengthened. So if we were perfect, then why do we need to be strengthened? If we were perfect, why do we need to grow? If we were perfect, why do we need to feed the human spirit? If we were perfect, why do we need to pray in the spirit, right? So the human spirit within us is perfect positionally in Christ, but practically there's a stage of growth, there's a stage of, you know, development. And so when a person sins, there is no such thing as, you know, well, my body did it, I didn't do it. No, you sinned. Spirit, soul, and body, you're responsible, right? Uh, so we can't go before God and say, God, my body sinned, but my soul and my spirit was not in agreement. No, you sinned. Spirit, soul, and body, you as a person are responsible. So sin is a spiritual thing. It affects spirit, soul, and body. So can a believer sin? Yeah. Does it mean it's only body sins and soul and spirit doesn't sin? No. You sin, spirit, soul, body, a person sins and is held responsible. So, so we need to understand the difference between positional truth and where we are practically, and then this journey of being perfected in Christ. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Pastor. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Stop here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Nancy, Pastor Paul, Pastor Roshin, and Sister Jean for sharing uh, your God's wisdom with us. And I'm sure each of us here are blessed every week after week because we all are learning together. So as the time is up, let's pray and bring the session to close. Uh, can I request any one of us to please lead us in prayer? Divya, can you lead us in prayer, please? Sure. Thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, Father, for this time that you gave us. Thank you, Lord, for teaching. Uh, Father, Lord, in every uh, questions, Father, Lord, we have uh, the solutions. We ha have the answers in your word, Father, Lord. We yes, thank sure. you for the wisdom, Lord, that you have poured out, Lord, into you know, our pastors, Father, Lord, to teach us, to guide us, Father, Lord, uh, from, uh, from the truths that they have learned from the word. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Father Lord, that we may be able to uh, hold on to these truths, Father Lord, and lead many others to uh, Christ, Lord. Uh, thank you and praise you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining in today's mentoring. Uh, see you all. God bless. Thank you.